Welcome once again to Alan Robson's Grizzly Tales podcast. And a huge thank you to those who have been kind enough to nip across to the robsonsworld.com website to donate to help keep this podcast and the website going. We need to cover its costs and that's all we're aiming for. And any help we get from you will go directly towards that. And tonight we have something, as always, a bit downright peculiar to start with. Now, at a time of crisis, everybody looks towards their leaders, the people in control, the presidents, the prime ministers, members of the royal family, whoever's in charge we look towards with the hope that they know better than we do about how to solve whatever the problem is. Usually we're kidding ourselves, but we choose to believe that because we want to feel safe and secure and cared for to a degree. So I'm going to tell you some bizarre and amazing stories about some of the most famous leaders the world has ever seen. And they may indeed be stories that you've never heard. Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks they know his story. But did you know he was English? Hmm. At least for 18 months of his life he was. He was born on Corsica in 1769 and he was 25 when the islanders, having kicked out the government of the Genoese, claimed sovereignty of the country, Corsica, to King George III of England and it became part of the British Empire for 18 months. The offer was made by the island's leader, Pasquale Pauli, whose secretary was actually Napoleon's dad. And the Napoleons were all on the side of annexing Corsica and letting it become part of Britain. Until, of course, in 1796, about 15 to 20 years later, when it became a province of France. And suddenly, Napoleon was not Genoese, He was no longer British or English and he had suddenly become French again. He was urged by Pauli to take a commission in the British army, you know, and Napoleon turned it down and because he did that, he would end up altering the entire history of every country in Europe. After the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon asked to become a British citizen. He had a a whole batch of fears as well. I'll tell you a few other things you probably don't know about about Borny. He had a terrifying fear of cats. He wouldn't go into any room where a cat was present. And once he was seen lunging at some tapestries hanging on a wall with his sabre. And the thrusts were not directed at the tapestry, A little kitten had crawled behind the tapestry. It was climbing up it, and he was trying to kill it with his sword. Also, Napoleon was not necessarily a particularly well man when he said to his lady, Not tonight, Josephine. It was usually not because he didn't want to, but because he physically couldn't. He suffered from incredible nasty constipation a type of constipation that we would now call impaction, when your poo turns to concrete and you've literally kind of got to dig it out. Because of this, he constantly suffered from hemorrhoids and the outside kind that hung down like grapes. Very nasty, not a pretty backside. And also, he ate his food really, really fast and he would throw balls of bread up in the air, catching them in his mouth. He also hated books, particularly novels. And once he caught his maidservant reading a love story, he grabbed it from her, threw it on the fire, and he gave her a book of logarithms instead because he was interested in mathematics. So, back to Josephine. On his and Josephine's wedding night, her pet dog jumped under the blankets and bit him. And 
thinking that he was attacking her when he was simply making love. Sadly to say, for somebody who would consider yeah, anyone French who think they're great lovers, he was buried without his penis. It was stolen after his post-mortem in 1821 by a priest. You can always trust a priest. And in 1971, this withered, shrunken little Willie came up for auction in London. And at the very last moment, it was withdrawn from bidding after failing to reach a reserve price. Okay, we've had Napoleon. Who else? Well, we've got to look at the Duke of Wellington. You know, the person who defeated him at the Battle of Waterloo. And he might well have been the winner there, but he was a lousy shot on the sporting arena. He once put nine pellets in Lord Granville's face. He also hit a dog, three windows, a couple of carriages, a gamekeeper, and a woman who was putting out a washing. And when she cried out that she'd been wounded, the woman was swiftly put in her place by the General's hostess, Lady Shelley, with the words, My good woman, this ought to be the proudest moment of your life. You have had the privilege of being shot by the great Duke of Wellington. Nowadays, we just sewed the bugger. Anyway, he was a very peculiar dresser as well. He used to change his clothes up to seven times a day. Every time he changed, he would rub himself down with a mixture of vinegar to get rid of any nasties and rose water so you couldn't smell the vinegar. And also, you know, in the First World War and the Second World War, British soldiers were called Tommies. Well, did you know that the name Tommy was actually created by the Duke of Wellington? Uh, a paper came to him while he was head of, of the war office. And they said, we're looking for a, a typical name for a British soldier. So he suggested the name of a soldier that had been a private in the 33rd foot. And his name was Tommy Adkins. He'd served valiantly, so he thought, yeah, just call him Tommy's. The eventual name Tommy Adkins was shortened to Tommy's for the First World War, and it followed on in the second. And also, you got to remember that the Duke of Wellington was a bit of a, a bit of a swanky lounge lizard and a bit of a ladies' man all his life. He was a sexually active pensioner, and was said to have had an affair with a politician's wife while he was in his eighties. Can I trust them leaders of any description? Let's have another one, Nelson, for example. Now, first of all, we all know Nelson for winning. Uh, an incredible battle called the Battle of Trafalgar on board his ship. But he didn't win it. He was dead before it started. It was actually won by his lieutenant from Morpeth in Northumberland called Cuthbert Collingwood, who took his place. Now, you see, Nelson, right from the beginning, was a total Charlie. But uh, I'll explain why a little bit later on. But a lot of people picture Nelson with a patch over his eye. He never wore an eye patch. He didn't even lose his eye. He lost the sight of his right eye back in 1794. But the difference between his bad right eye and his good left one was scarcely noticeable. So what he did, instead of wearing a patch, he put a little bit of green shade under the brim of his cocked hat more to protect his left eye from the glare of the sun on the sea rather than hide the fact that he was, well, frankly, a bit bong-eyed. He felt self-conscious about being called Horatio as well, as you would. You wouldn't have got out of the West End in Newcastle if you were a Horatio. So he attempted to call himself Horace, daftly thinking that that was marginally better than Horatio, but his father, who was a Norfolk clergyman, stopped him from doing so. Now, his life was saved by another Northeasterner called John Sykes at the blockade of Cadiz, when Sykes held up his own hand to parry a sword blow that would have killed Nelson. His hand was severed from his arm. But Nelson wasted the life that was saved 
because he didn't need to die at the Battle of Trafalgar. What he said was that he was going to go out on deck in full military honours. That means he wore a really bright uniform with four huge stars of decoration on his left breast over his heart, making the perfect sitting target for snipers. They said, look, people, the snipers will shoot at you, you become a targeted man. And Nelson said, oh, I don't mind that. And as soon as he stepped out on deck, he got shot and he was gone. And all he had to do was change into a planar coat. Now, this is where it gets interesting as well, because they pickled his body on the homeward journey. His hair was cut off and they put his naked, shot, dead body in a large cask of brandy. The only item of clothes that he had on at his time was his long white shirt. Now, what made this worse was that when the ship got back to England so that Nelson could be taken out and buried, there was no brandy left in the cask. On the way back, all of the other sailors had been sneaking a little tot here and there, and they'd finished off the entire cask, and Napoleon was looking less um, preserved and rather more crinkled. And the worst thing is, he's lying in another man's grave. A sarcophagus that was built for Cardinal Woolsey was given to him. His coffin was made by his ship's carpenter out of a piece of the mainmast of the French flagship Lorient, which had been blown up at the Battle of the Nile by one of Nelson's ships. The coffin had been made shortly after the battle and Nelson kept it in his cabin behind his chair. But he's in another man's tomb belonging to Cardinal Woolsey. So as you can see, we've had three incredibly famous people and they're all in effect frankly a bit of a whack job. Otto von Bismarck, the Prussian statesman, what about him? Well, he should have been in every medical case book because he had pretty much every ailment possible at that time. In his 60s, uh, he suffered from gout, gallstones, jaundice, insomnia, migraine, flu, rheumatism, neuralgia, varicose veins, two or three cases of shingles, severe cramps, chronic indigestion, because he was an overeater in a bit of a tubby, and he suffered from horrific hemorrhoids. And one night he went into a beer saloon in Prussia and he was just about to have his first drink of the night when he heard someone insulting the royal family. Incensed, he ran across to smash the glass over the offender's head, but walked over to him, drank the beer out of it first, then smashed it over his head. What about Prime Ministers? What a shower we've had over the years. Gladstone, there's a name from the past you probably heard. William Hewitt Gladstone became uh, Prime Minister of Britain, and he was a self-flagellator. Yeah, before and after his visits to brothels, and he would tell people, I'm there to rescue fallen women, but always the young and attractive ones, it had to be noted, he would beat himself with a whip to drive out all of his carnal lusts and anything that aroused him. He had a taste for reading pornographic material, and he had one of the biggest collections that anybody had ever seen. And he also had the forefinger of his left hand missing. Now, he accidentally shot it off when he was cleaning a gun. And it kind of went further in his family as well. His sister Helen was an opium addict, and yet she was a mad Roman Catholic. And once she strung together the pages of books written by Protestant luminaries and put them in her toilet so that people could use that Bible as toilet paper. She had so much contempt for it. Let's have another Prime Minister. David Lloyd George. A lot of people in the war said that he knew their father. And yet he was probably one of the most clumsy people on earth. He said he could never open a window at number 10 Downing Street without hurting his fingers. His own secretary wrote that. He was completely incapable of opening the dining room door at number 10 Downing Street. On some occasions, 
he would wait behind it for up to 20 minutes until somebody else came that could open it for him. He would always grab hold of the doorknob and turn it the wrong way. And he would seem it was impossible for him to turn it the other way. After minutes, sometimes up to 20 to 25, he would petulantly rattle the doorknob until somebody else came along and they opened it immediately. He had problems, that guy. Now, we have a lot more very famous people. Shall I share a few more with you? Well, what about Winston Churchill? We all loved uh, Winston, Winnie. He had native red American Indian blood in his veins. His mother, Jenny, was an American uh, whose great-great-grandmother was an Iroquois squaw called Mary Barr. Churchill's own grandmother on his mother's side so resembled a native red Indian that she was known as Sitting Bull within the family. Now, he was born prematurely, shortly after his mother fell while she was out shooting, and she was only seven months pregnant. He was breastfed by a wet nurse so that his mother could continue doing the rounds of high society. She didn't want a child on a tit. And at his first school, St George's Ascot, his report, and we all hated those school reports, this one was in 1884, and the headmaster wrote, This boy has no ambition at all. His father Randolph died of syphilis that went on to affect his brain, leading Winston not to be able to even talk to him. And Churchill in his early life spoke with a lisp and he was completely against giving women the vote. He once said about the suffragettes, we already have enough ignorant voters, we don't need any more. And then he married the love of his life, a lady called Clementine, and she was amazed to discover that he wore ladies' pink silk underwear. Yeah, might have saved us during World War II, but there was an issue or two there, I think you'll find. Something about Ho Chi Minh, what about that? You know who he is? He was a Vietnamese revolutionary leader. And do you know he was once a dishwasher in the kitchen of the Carlton Hotel in London? Everywhere you look, there's fascinating things. You've just got to dig them out, and nobody digs. So that's down to me. Jesus. Let's get to Jesus. Now, don't upset you if you're a Christian, but we know that there is absolutely no proof that he ever existed. None whatsoever. Not of his birth, not of his death, not of any of the things that he is said to have done, because all of those things had been done previously by other people claiming to be messiahs. There were seven in total. And also, many of them were written down in Chinese writings about 3,000 years before Christ was born. So they weren't new stories, they were just old stories pinched. What can you prove? Well, you can prove that there was a wanted poster issued by Pontius Pilate for someone called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you could say. However, they weren't wanting to arrest him because he was a messiah, they wanted to arrest him because he was a thief. About five feet tall, with a hump, dark eyebrows that meet in the middle, a long nose, going bald, with a thin beard, so that they that see him might be affrighted. That's what was written on the wanted poster. Of course, the Christians changed that to a six feet, blue-eyed, copiously bearded, graceful person, with hair the colour of ripe hazelnuts. Ah, well, there you go. That's hype for you. And there's spin uh, everywhere you look. Then, let's have a look at some more of those great leaders. Kaiser Bill. There was a hit years ago called uh, Kaiser Bill's Batman, like a whistly thing. But the real Kaiser Bill, the German ruler, was born with a withered left arm that hung loose in its socket. He had a neck injury that made his head kind of lean to the left, and he was deaf in one ear. He seemed to try and overcompensate for all of his disabilities by being arrogant and belligerent, and it was his fault that led to the bloodbath of the First World War. The Kaiser's War, it was called when it first started, but if you go back even further than that, at the age of four, he was a hostile little beggar. At the wedding of his uncle, 
and his uncle was the Prince of Wales, King Edward VII, he sank his teeth into the legs of his other uncles, who were all wearing kilts. To correct his neck defect as a child, he was forced to wear a neck-stretching device, consisting of a, a bit of a leather bridle, connected to an iron bar that went up his back to hold the bridle in place. And once his doctor told him he had a little cold, the child replied, No, it's a big cold. Everything about me must be big. He also had a bit of a sadistic habit of turning his rings round back to front and then shaking hands with his inferiors with a vice-like grip in order just to hurt them. But his party piece, because let's face it, we've all got one, his party piece was to imitate the sound of a champagne bottle popping open and being poured into a glass. You know the... You know, that kind of thing. Blimey. I bet there were long, long evening nights and numbers days. And also, he was the grandson of Queen Victoria, who spent the last hours on her deathbed being supported by him using his only good arm. Let's get to some dark stories. But remember, I'm always looking for the downright peculiar. And I hope that you will come with us every week on the Grizzly Tales podcast. Okay, where do we begin? Well, tonight I'm going to tell you the story of some of the angels of Auschwitz. At Lochenhead Farm in Dunscore, Dumfriesshire, young Jane Haining was born, the fifth child of Jane and Thomas Haining. She grew up as part of an evangelical Craig church in Dunscore in Scotland. Now, she had a few jobs as a clerk or as a secretary whilst hosting the Sunday school and she was spend any spare money that she had buying the children tuppence happy cream buns. And it was when the church had a visit from a missionary who gave a talk about all he had achieved, plain Jane Haining knew at once what she had to do, admitting this was her life's work. She returned to the office while scanning the press for opportunities overseas. And finally, in the Church of Scotland magazine Life and Work, she spotted a vacancy for a matron for a girls' hostel attached to a Jewish mission school in Budapest in Hungary. Now, the mission looked after both Jewish and Christian girls, and Jane saw that as a perfect fit. So after training in the Celtic heartland of Edinburgh, Seven months before Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany on July 30th, 1933, Haining was off to Budapest. She taught and counselled the mostly Jewish school population, dotted with the odd Christian. And then on the declaration of war, Haining was actually holidaying in Britain. She was in Cornwall with Margaret Prem, the head of the mission's elementary school. They returned immediately to Budapest and the journey back was hellish. Haining wrote, the journey back was a nightmare. Five changes, no porters, no hot food, crowded trains like a bank holiday, plus luggage, no sanitary conveniences fit to mention, two nights spent sleeping on a platform beside our luggage. The Church of Scotland ordered her back to Scotland for her own safety, but she said that she felt totally safe in Hungary so decided to stay. On getting back there, she wrote, I'm glad to say we are shaking down into something of an order, although it was a month after I came back before I was able to have one complete day off duty. The children are gradually getting into harness and I am having time to miss the letters which do not come. Of the war, it is better not to speak. And indeed, there is nothing to say in a letter. Hungary is neutral and anxious to remain so, so we who are enjoying her hospitality are refraining from talking politics. Then, the Great Surge began in 1941, where Jews from all over German-occupied Europe began pouring into the neutral countries, including Hungary, to avoid the increasing Holocaust. Food was becoming very scarce, markets had very little to sell, Jane began chopping up her leather suitcase to repair some of the girl's shoes. 
She was certain that she was protected and safe, as most of Europe had fell before Hill. All the while, the Jewish mission sought to help Jewish families in need, find them places to stay, find them things to do to make money. And another man, with Celtic roots, the Reverend George Knight, was the mission's superintendent and he said, it was a time of fear, a war of nerves, but thousands of German Jews flooded into Hungary and the mission found itself on the front line. Jane worked hard to resettle and care for these terrified souls who were all certain that the Nazis would follow them into Hungary. And then, on the 19th of March in 1944, the German Wehrmacht invaded Hungary and immediately the SS began deporting Jews to Auschwitz. The death camp was ethnically cleansing huge Jewish populations, the disabled, the gay and people of any colour other than white. The SS Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann followed Hitler's plan and that was for him to lead a Sonderreinsatzkommando Ungarn, a special intervention unit for Hungary. And by the end of the first month, anti-Jewish laws were introduced. By the 5th of April, Jews were not allowed to own cars, radios, telephones, to move home, to use public baths or swimming pools, to wear a school uniform, to use restaurants or cafes, visit bars or food markets. Each Jewish family had to declare everything they had, particularly money or property. Those who tried to hide things were shot. Trains left Hungary three times a day for the death camps. Any remaining Jews from the age of six had to wear a huge yellow badge in the shape of the Star of David. Many were arrested, beaten or raped for wearing the wrong sized star, for putting the star on the wrong side or any other excuse needed by the Germans who sought cruelty at every opportunity. As Jewish numbers diminished, the SS began herding the rest into holding areas, including warehouses, factories and ghettos where they were not given food nor water. All the while, back in Budapest, Jane Haining had been helping any Jewish people that had arrived there and tried to get her mission children out of the country. When in May 1944, two Gestapo officers arrived at Jane's mission room declaring her a Jew lover. They gave her 15 minutes to pack and then she was held in the cellars of the local police HQ. Now when the consulate asked why an innocent British citizen had been arrested, they replied that a Hungarian char lady had denounced Haining for having a secret radio transmitter. It was never found. In fact, the char lady may have been part of the Hungarian freedom fighters and she used this foreigner Haining as a stooge when her secret transmitter could have been uncovered. Haining's loyal friends took her food parcels and clean underwear and she was taken before the SS, some say including Eichmann and his SS committee, to face a number of charges. Those charges included working amongst Jews, weeping as she sewed stars onto the girls, being fully active politically, having British visitors, listening to the news on the BBC, hiding a radio transmitter, sacking a housekeeper who was an Aryan, visiting any prisoners of war from Britain, making up and distributing food parcels to Jews and other criminals. Now, she tried to explain that the Hungarian government had given her permission to visit and help British prisoners, but it didn't matter one jot. She admitted all the other charges and ended up being sent to the Kistaksa transit camp. There, she wept for days. She spent almost three weeks in prison and was fairly sure that she would be sent to a pleasant outdoor camp. The fact is, there were no such camps. A Hungarian bishop, Ravach, had heard about Haining's arrest and had asked the Germans to release her. Yet they didn't even bother to reply to him. In April in 1944, barely two months into their occupation of Hungary, 
they flooded the extermination camp Auschwitz to Birkenau in Poland with Hungarian Jews and Jane Haining. The SS filled freight wagons transporting 12,000 a day. According to Hitler's own minister, Edmund Wiesenmeyer, they deported 437,402 Jews, almost the entire Hungarian Jewish population. Also, anyone who was disabled, anyone who was gay, anyone who was of colour. Two days in an animal container without food, water, one bucket for a toilet with little air, no privacy. A fair percentage would die on the way. In trucks capable of housing 60 people, they wedged 120. With each bounce of the train, the filth in the bucket sloshed into the people. People had to learn to overcome their inhibitions just to be able to use the bucket as a toilet and know there was no paper to clean yourself. People were stinking, starving and dehydrating and this would lead to rows and arguments. People were so dry that even if they had bread that they had hidden, they couldn't eat it because they didn't have enough saliva. June 1944 was very hot and Haining was in such a truck. Beside her, older people died of heart attacks. Others took to hysterics. They were driven mad, also knowing that they were going somewhere to be wiped out. Yet they couldn't do a single thing about it. The trains into Auschwitz too were on three separate lanes and stopped near the gas chambers so a new train could arrive whilst the previous one was being unloaded. The crematoria there was burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and could barely cope. Jewish prisoners, called the Sonderkommando, had to start digging huge fire pits, pushing in all of the older Jews and burning them alive. Around 90% of Hungarian Jews went straight into the gas chambers on arrival. The rest were used as slave labor. Haining and many of her girls from the Scottish Mission School arrived in Auschwitz II together in May 1944. And the Celt Haining was chosen for slave labor and had a number tattooed on her arm, 79467. One of the very few letters out of Auschwitz arrived to her best friend, Margit Prem, and she passed it on to the Church of Scotland. It was written in pencil in a very shaky hand. My dearest Margit, I have not yet had an answer to my first letter, but I know there is nothing I can do about it. I'll repeat it briefly in case by any chance you haven't received it. You're allowed to write to me twice a month, and I'm allowed to write once a month, but only to you. Packages are not restricted by number or name. I asked you to register me with our Red Cross, but I should like it if you could possibly send me apples or other fresh fruit and biscuits, rusks, and other types of bread. And of course, as the Red Cross doesn't send stuff like that, your loving Jean. Two days after sending that very letter, the SS released a statement. Miss Haining, who was arrested on account of justified suspicion of espionage against Germany, died in hospital July 17th of cachexia following intestinal catarrh. Yet there were suspicions that she may well have been operated on by Dr. Josef Mengele. Her friends chose to believe that she died peacefully in her bed in that horrific concentration camp. Yet there is a story that runs parallel with that of an amazing survivor of the death camp and the vicious Dr. Death, Josef Mengele. And her name was Francie Rabinek. She was 19 when Hitler's Blitzkrieg entered and took over Czechoslovakia in March 1939. The last words from her mother was, your only duty is to stay alive. Her response was to shout back, I will, I will. Just prior to this, the young teenage girl teeming with life, high-spirited and strong-willed, 
had proven to have an unquenchable zest for life, recently taking over her mother's high fashion business in Prague, and it was becoming a massive success. She admitted to being carefree, slightly spoiled, and mainly interested in dancing, her shop, flirting, and skiing. But in 1942, she, her parents, and her husband were rounded up and taken to a military transit camp 40 miles away in Teretzin. This is her story as told by her. It was late at night when we stopped at a platform with a big sign that read Auschwitz. That name meant absolutely nothing to me. Even before the train doors opened, I heard bellowing and cursing in German and Polish. Outside I could see, amongst the SS guards, a large number of strange creatures with shaved heads and dressed in a slight blue and grey pyjamas. We were pushed and jostled. It was very uncomfortable and we were forced into a long column in order to march along a dirt road flanked by double walls of barbed wire. At intervals along it were signs in German saying caution, high voltage. The entire spooky scene was illuminated by light beams from watchtowers every hundred yards or so. There were barking, snarling dogs and SS men everywhere. A few striped figures flitted back and forth in the dark, carefully keeping out of the way of the SS. Halfway through our trek, one of them appeared next to me. He was dragging a stretcher, carrying a twisted, starved corpse. He said, hi, in Czech, and to my surprise, I recognised him as Tommy, an old friend, and he explained hurriedly that everything of value would be taken from us. But if I gave him whatever I wanted to keep, he would smuggle it into the camp for me. I had so very little. Two wristwatches, a fountain pen, a toothbrush, a comb and some stockings. And after pushing the items under a cloth with the corpse, Tommy disappeared into the darkness. Polish prisoners in striped uniforms were registering our data and after giving them my details, I acquired a tattoo on my arm. A hyphen. 4116. I was assigned to Block 12, which was occupied by mainly elderly women, and after a period in quarantine, another face from my past appeared. Why did you come here? Don't you know you're going to be burned? You should have run away. Nobody gets out of here alive. Well, it was Kitty, my second cousin and lifelong friend. I was convinced that she'd gone stark raving mad. What was all this irrational nonsense that she was blurting out? Listen to me, said Kitty. I see by your face that you don't believe me. Come out and I'll show you. And I followed her out into the camp, and there, in the distance, Kitty showed me a group of chimneys spewing smoke into the sky. And for the first time since my arrival, I became aware of a peculiar smell in the air kind of like burning hair. But all this is quite impossible, I said. This is a big camp. They may just be burning the corpses of people who have died a natural death. Oh yeah, said Kitty. So how do you explain that 1,750 people disappear every night? That night, as I lay on my bunk, Eyes wide open even though I hadn't slept for 60 hours. Images were chasing each other as if in a crazy film montage. Chimneys, kitty, barbed wire, my parents, where were they? I used to disappear into my own world, trying to push away any horror I saw on a daily basis. I nurtured wild fantasies of escape. I spent the hours of the night before sleep working out meticulous plans for an escape. But with daylight came the terrible awareness of the impossibility of these pipe dreams. Other nights I spun out endless fantasies about a platonic love affair that I'd had when I was 17. Now I imagined the wildest love scenes that had ever taken place, feeling his arms around me, even smelling the scent of his pipe. May turned into June and the camp atmosphere became more tense. The SS were stepping up their favourite entertainment, which was to have anywhere from 50 to a few hundred prisoners report for calisthenics. 
They would then order them to do push-ups, knee bends, running on the spot until these poor, starved individuals dropped from exhaustion. Each prisoner that fell appeared to prove the theory of the inferiority of the Jewish race, and they would then go to the gas ovens. Then, in the middle of June, we heard some startling news. The treatment of Jews was to undergo a dramatic change. An order had come directly from Berlin. The new idea was not to kill Jews capable of work, but to send them to any place that had acute labour shortages and then work them so hard that nature would take its course. There would be a selection in the next few days in which people aged 15 to 40 years of age would be chosen for the work camps. So, June 20th, 1944, the process began. A thunderstorm was roaring in the background, who was getting closer and closer as some 2,500 women massed in the children's block for selection. While we huddled at one end of the yard, Dr. Josef Mengele stood at the other with his aides. His arms were crossed at the chest and he wore shiny riding boots. Someone barked an order for every woman to strip to the skin and put our clothes under our left arms. A parade then began, each of us in single file, and on arrival in front of the doctor, each woman had to stand to attention and answer several questions. Afterwards, Mengele indicated with a jerk of his thumb that people had to move to the left or to the right. Very soon, a simple pattern emerged. The group on the left was clearly for the death chimneys. It included the weak, the old looking, those wearing glasses who were considered disabled, those who were disabled, or even those that had any scar on their bodies at all. The people on the right would be destined for work camps and to survive. The storm was directly above us now. The thunder and lightning made the scene as a few thousand naked women stood in front of 20 booted Germans, all grinning. It had the feel of a fantasy of some insane surrealist painter. As I watched, I made a mental note that even young and strong girls that had appendectomy scars ended up in the gas ovens. I had one too, so I needed to think quickly. It was now my turn to be interviewed by the doctor. Number, number, age, married, profession. And when I replied to profession, I said electrician, and there was a pause. What? Repeat that? I said electrician again. Is that true? You know how to pull wires and such? I confirmed it to be true. And he pointed me to the right and made a note of it. Mengele ordered a scribe. And I joined Kitty. I'd made it and began to put on my clothes. The other girls crowded round me and explained that the idea of declaring myself an electrician had come to me on the spur of the moment when I was frantically thinking of something original to distract them from the fact that I'd had an operation scar on my stomach. Now, it wasn't totally an outright lie since my father had been an electrical engineer and had always encouraged me to learn how to fix faulty wiring or a broken appliance at home. And the day came for my departure and once again we were loaded onto cattle trucks. Slowly, gathering speed, the train took at least 20 minutes to get out of the Auschwitz complex. I was terrified. Only in daylight did we get the sense of the immensity of this death factory. Then quite suddenly, from inside, we were outside and the view changed. The train began passing through flowering meadows and babbling brooks, lush green, and it was totally unbelievable. Someone started to sing, and soon the entire train was running through a repertoire of Czech folk songs. 
Empty stomachs were forgotten. We laughed and teased each other like an exuberant bunch of children intoxicated on the joy of still being alive. Even the armed guards travelling with us could not suppress their smiles. For the next nine months, Francie was in a camp in Hamburg, and she impressed the Germans with her skill as an electrician. And by March 1945, with the war in its final weeks, the Hamburg camp was badly bombed, and poor Francie ended up heading back for Bergen-Belsen. Francie takes up the story. The whole city of Hamburg was a sea of flames. We were suddenly lined up and marched back into those freight cars to be evacuated. And the following day, we arrived at our sick destination, Bergen-Belsen. The ghoulish sight that greeted us topped anything that we had seen so far. In a quadrangle, a mile long and 40 yards wide, were 40,000 people who looked like corpses. Alongside them were 13,000 unburied bodies being fed on by insects and birds. The sort of death dance seemed to be in progress with one of the living dragging a dead body of someone they loved by their feet towards the mass graves, unable to do anything other than travel in slow motion despite the shouts and kicks of the SS for them to hurry up. The ground was crawling with lice. There was no food and water was scarce. Some people were eating dirty grass. Most were just sitting or lying around, their deep socketed eyes staring out as they just waited to die. Some of the piled corpses still had a flicker of life in them. One of the newly arrived girls found her cousin with her eyelids still flickering, yet she was on the pile of dead bodies. She pulled her out of, of the corpses and incredibly brought her back to life. But it was so hard to recognize anyone. These were not humans anymore. They were skeletons covered only with a gray parchment-like skin and eyes sunk so deep in their sockets. Aside from wandering aimlessly in search of friends or relatives or to find something edible, there was nothing else to do but pick off other people's lice and eat them. Still, the obligatory roll call took place twice a day with German thoroughness, a pointless undertaking since no one could possibly produce an accurate count anymore. People who were alive in the morning would be dead by noon. The sleeping quarters were mainly empty huts, crawling with lice. Most of the bunks had been used as firewood. There were no pallets or blankets, and the rooms were so overcrowded that we slept on the bare floor with our heads on someone else's body. A typhus epidemic had started two months before. There was no need for the gas chambers now that people were dying at the rate of 200 to 350 a day. There was talk of cannibalism in the men's section, and considering that we saw many a corpse with a part of their thighs cut out, it was very probably true. And one day there was a sudden distribution of bread rations, although food provision had come to a standstill weeks before. The starved inmates sank their teeth into the bread to discover a strange grating sound when they chewed. The Germans, for fun, had baked ground glass into the door, and no one would ever know how many people died of intestinal bleeding, because many ate it, regardless of the danger. It was not easy to think rationally anymore. There was no humanity there. Just death. On the morning of April 15th, 1945, the door was open just a crack when one of the girls said that a tank was coming down the road. We're probably going to be machine gunned, someone replied. No, there's a white star on the side of it. The hatches are open. The soldiers are wearing black berries, 
the girl insisted. Someone grumbled, To hell with your fairy tales! But our curiosity got the better of us. She was right. The tank was no mirage, nor the star on its side, or the long convoy of vehicles following it. The British were here. A man, who was Scottish, for he was wearing a kilt, reached out to us, but we shied away. He openly sobbed at seeing us, looking the way that we did. He said his name was Billy, and he threw a water flask at our feet. Yet we barely had the strength to pick it up. Yet his kindness we will never forget. We were so frail. I truly believe that had we not had water that day, none of us would have made it through the night. We stared up with tears in our eyes. The Union Jack fluttered in the wind. But the inmates, most of them, were too far gone to take in the full reality of it, even to feel joy. Hesitantly, still expecting to be shot at, the prisoners began to venture out. It was far too late to save so very many. Even the kindness of the British soldiers ended up killing them, so fragile were they. One after another, the armoured vehicles came up the road. Every soldier turned out their pockets. They threw us everything they had. Biscuits, water, sweets, chocolate, cigarettes and other little things all thrown towards us. Then they gave us a V for victory salute. Many of them were crying, as we were. But we couldn't cry properly. We didn't have any water in our bodies to create tears. But inside we were sobbing. By the afternoon, big lorries arrived, delivering us proper food and water that the Britons had found in a German warehouse. One two-pound can of meat from Czechoslovakia and a small tin of condensed milk per person. Kitty dug into that meat with her fingers, devouring her tin of pork in one sitting and washing it down with the milk. In contrast, I was not able to force down a single mouthful. The following day, the British opened all of the gates, including that of the German storehouses. There were huge buildings with a red cross painted on them, with enough food in there to feed an entire army for months. They had wanted the camp's inhabitants to starve to death. With suicidal greed, anybody who could still walk crowded in, and in a state of mass hysteria, people literally drowned head first in a barrel of pickles, Another died choking to death in a barrel of mustard, another in a barrel of butter, whilst others tried to get in over them. Kitty and I watched from outside, too weak to join in any battle, even for food. But later, we noticed our skeleton-like comrades emerging from another, less crowded storehouse, dressed up like German soldiers in their shiny boots, and we ventured inside. We helped ourselves to two magnificent fur-lined coats that reached all the way to the floor, and also a tent. And thus equipped, we occupied one of the deserted watchtowers to get away from the lice. It did not upset us that at the base of the tower was a heap of twisted corpses that seemed to change facial expressions with the light of day and night, and encroaching shadows. Nor did it bother us that the tower was open to the elements. After putting up the tent against the biting wind, we wrapped ourselves in our new fur-lined coats, and for the very first time in years, we slept like princesses. Francie had kept her promise to her parents. She had survived two of the Nazis' very worst extermination camps, and bravely outwitted Dr. Josef Mengele, Dr. Death. It's generally believed that the Germans never sent any Jew to the hospital. If one became ill, they said they were going to the hospital, but instead they put them into the gas ovens. There were no exceptions. So when asked about the fate of Jane Haining, Francie replied, 
if she was in the hospital, she was in the hands of Mengele. The hospital was for experiments on the living, and no one ever came out alive. Francie then returned to Prague, only to discover that her husband and both parents had died in the gas chamber. And that first kind, brave soldier, Billy from Scotland, and another Celtic thread to the story, had saved her life. Yet on saving it, perhaps we learn just how painfully Jane Haining may have died. Mengele was experimenting with genetics, having been given no boundaries. So often his work involved inhuman practices. Performing a range of agonizing and lethal experiments with twins of all ages and Jewish and Romany children, he collected the eyes of his murdered victims so he could research pigmentation. On some occasions, he just tore the eyes out of living people on the way to the gas oven, as if they were not going to suffer enough. On adults, he allowed the progression of noma, a type of gangrene that destroys the mucous membrane of the mouth. Dr. Mishklov Nizitsli, a prisoner, often helped Mengele, and he said, when the doctor had the chance to experiment with British, French, or Scandinavian prisoners, Aryan looking, he always took it, for he believed that they were the nearest thing to his own proud Aryan race, especially the British. Yet another incredible story of survival and death, all sewn together with that age-old Celtic thread. Incredible tales, and true as ever. We try and give you the truth, no matter how shocking it is. And it just shows you the courage that anyone had to have just to live a day in such a place. Once again, I thank you for visiting robsonsworld.com and checking out the stories there. It's vitally important to keep that website and the podcast going. So if you can spare a bit of time to nip across to Robson's World and donate anything, no matter how small, every little helps and will go directly towards keeping it going. I'm not technically adept enough to be able to do it myself. So uh, sincere thanks to you. Let's keep on keeping on. And until next week and another incredible story and a bit of daftness to boot from me alan robson thank you stay well god bless you and i wish you well Thank you.